So thank you for coming. Last last segment of the day before the reception, which I um, understand will begin at 5:15. So no break, an awkward break in between this session and going to the reception, which is right around the corner. But until then, we have two presenters. Um, Please to introduce them. Allison Babo. Thank you. Thank you. I hate to ask this, how do I get to drive? Uh, Bit.ly slash LD4 Press. P-R-E-S. Yeah, that should be that. So while she's bringing up her presentation, I'll give you her a little intro. Um, Allison has served since 2004 as both the digital librarian and research coordinator for the Perseus Digital Library Project at Tufts University. Her current research interests include digital libraries and digital humanities, metadata creation and cataloging, and new roles for librarians in supporting the complex world of digital scholarship. She'll be speaking to us about the Perseus catalog. Without further ado, thank you very much. Uh, so again, I'm Allison Bayview, and I have worked at Perseus for over 15 years, and I have way more slides than there's time for a lightning talk. You'll have to forgive me, because we had three people, now we're down to two, and Michelle kindly said we had more time to talk, and that was that's never a good thing if you tell me I have more time to talk. <laughs> so today I'm going to try and not talk from my slides, but talk about them, a little bit about the metadata we have, um, our goals and moving towards linked data, and sort of our slow, slow movement in this direction. I even threw the other right arrow. So what's the Perseus Catalog? We are a research project and component of the Perseus Digital Library. Uh, we first went online in 2013. Um, we provide addition level metadata and online links to thousands of works by classical authors. Uh, we started kind of small as a test catalog for the Perseus Collection online around 2005. And then um, over the years we decided that we wanted to um, find more and more texts. And in about in 2013, my boss, Greg Crane, I got a Humboldt professorship in Germany, and he started a project called Open Greek and Latin. So we moved, we expanded even further the ideas about what we wanted to do. So the Pershing's Digital Library is a library of texts, art and archaeological objects, and a whole number of digital tools. Um, it's even older than the catalog. Uh, planning for it began in 85. It first had a CD-ROM published in 1992 that I can remember using. Uh, we moved online in 94. Um, our current interface was introduced in 2005, but what was once um, a collection of digital resources in the Greco-Roman world is now expanding to all types of areas of the digital humanities. I like to joke that I've been around long enough to remember when we were called a humanities computing project instead of a digital humanities project. But our focus of the last few years has definitely returned to classical language materials with the creation of OGL. So the PDL over the last few years has been transitioning from a very closed style of publication of sort of TEI XML files on our own dedicated website to a much more collaborative open access model. Uh, we released our first new reading environment, um, the Scape Digital Library in 2018. And this draws off of text in GitHub. We, over the last five years, have moved all of our metadata, all of our code, and all of our text into GitHub, and that's sometimes been a very arduous process. And I wanted to put a slide thanking all the people who funded us over the years, but I realized that would have taken up my entire length of talk. So the re there's a reason this is timeline slide three, because I had two other timeline slides which I wisely removed because they're the previous history, whereas today I want to focus on this. In 2016, um, for the, about three years, our catalog ran in Blacklight. And due to staffing and financial changes, and I love Blacklight, it's a wonderful software, but we always had some issues in that he had had to do all types of custom programming to adapt our metadata to work within Blacklight. And then due to some staffing changes, uh, we were no longer able to do that. So in the summer of 2017, we couldn't decide if it was on we or despair that set in, but we realized we were gonna have to make a change and do something different. So we um, contracted with Agile Humanities and Cliff to just get someone from the outside to look at our metadata, to look at our infrastructure and see maybe what we could do differently. Maybe a new interface, maybe a new way of creating metadata, so for, over the course of a year, I worked with Cliff, looking at our metadata, um, seeing how well it did or didn't work. Um, Cliff made some suggestions about linked data, and I'll talk a little bit about more of that in a second. Um, and so in, basically over the last year, um, Cliff did an initial linked data conversion for us, which we're still reviewing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. So I talked a little bit about our evolving goals, and our goals have really changed again in the last year or two, in many ways trying to get back to the original idea behind the catalog. 
which was more about a knowledge base, about Greek and Latin texts, not just the texts and the authors within Perseus, but within, there are lots of digital collections online, some created by libraries, some created by enthusiasts, but ways of trying to link all of that metadata. Because so we will sometimes have users who will write to Perseus and say, I have an edition I want to give to you, you know, and then we would have no good way to publish that or even have the metadata about that. We've been doing a lot of thinking about ways to link what we have to the larger world. Now this is just a screenshot of the Perseus catalog. It's at catalog.perseus.org. The interface hasn't changed in the last six years. And this is just a, a sample record. Uh, this happens to be a record for the Iliad, and it shows you could find the text of Perseus, or you could find it in the full book at the Open Content Alliance. And there's a lot of stuff about identifiers in the way we sort of call it linkable data that I won't get into here. So the metadata in our catalog, um, it was um, we created mods records for every digital text in Perseus, as well as for hundreds of editions in the Google Books, the Internet Archive, and Hopi Trust. Uh, we created MADS records for thousands of classical authors and text groups, and all that is now on GitHub. Uh, part of this work was driven by our participation in, does anyone know what the Open Content Alliance is? It was the mass digitization project, it was the name given to the one done by the Internet Archive. And so, for a long time, we never thought we would be able to get digital editions of texts into Perseus, so we focused on, like, finding it because there were all these books going online and we wanted to link to all these works and all these authors that we would never have in Perseus. So we created these extremely granular records with page level links right into Google Books or right into the Open Content Alliance or other places. And part of that was creating this humongous bibliography, which I won't link to because it will blow my screen, of authors, works, and editions that we've worked on with different teams over the years to try and create. And we focused largely on the public domain. Because that has always been one of the big goals of Perseus, which is to, if we provide a link to something, we want our users to get access to it, whether it's an edition or a translation. Um, so when we moved the beta, when we moved the metadata to GitHub for our beta interface, we had to do a lot of things to the metadata to make it work with something called the site standard, which I won't get into here, but it's a standard within the digital classics domain about how you structure your texts and how you create unique URLs for them. But this also, as Cliff mentioned earlier in his presentation, created a huge amount of redundant metadata. And so when we first put the, um, the data online in 2013, we wanted to make it all linked to open data. Um, so back back our wonderful road plan that we wrote in 2013, uh, we were going to release all the data as triples, we were going to add RDFA attributes. None of that happened, unfortunately. And the data in the frozen beta instant is currently just available. It's, there are atom feeds, so there is so it's always what I like to call linkable data. We basically had the lack of resources, time, and expertise to really produce full linked open data in 2013. Um, the, the one thing we did do is all the research published within the catalog, they do have canonical URIs. <coughs> we published them for our text groups, our works, and our translation records, so that making the promise that if someone linked to a record within our catalog, we hope to, you know, to keep the, that record in perpetuity. All of the resources that are published under the Perseus Digital Library, whether it's on our library or in our catalog, do have canonical URIs which was why I always call it in presentations, I call it linkable data rather than linked data because you can link to us, but we can't give you anything to take back with you. So, um, as I said earlier, we decided to bring in Cliff and just to get an idea of, we noted there were numerous problems with how we created metadata and with our interface. Um, we, the way we had been storing, we had one big repository in GitHub that stored all the corrected metadata and all the changed metadata, so you can imagine that testing changes to the interface when you ingested another 500 records were not always that well. We had had to do a custom programming approach, so enter Agile, Fervor, Ooh, and Cliff. So they, what was really helpful is that when you, I know if anyone's created data or metadata for a very long time, you often stop thinking about why you created or how you created it, and I think that was certainly true for myself. Because we had been, I always like to call us Fervor inspired rather than sort of actually Ferber compliant. My boss always called us Ferber compliant. I'm like, Ferber's not a data model, it's a bibliographic idea. So you can't actually be, sort of, you can't actually be conformant, you just are inspired. So we used our mods records for everything, basically. For the expressions, for the works, uh, there were not really well-made distinctions between them, which meant that trying, when anyone tried to pull data out automatically, uh, it didn't work very well. And even with, um, even with um, moving towards modeling, pulling data out and modeling it in Ferber OO, that was still, you know, I like to say too much semantic complexity, too little time. But we did come up with a few good ideas about how to change our metadata so that both we could both make it more quickly and describe it more easily as we move towards linked data. Um, we 
all the mods records that have gotten broken up, which have resulted in thousands of records, basically one per um, edition, one per translation, we kind of recompiled them. Because one of the questions, as much silly as this may sound, one of the questions that people would often ask is, well, how many editions have you cataloged? And because all the records were broken up, we didn't actually have a good count on how many books were actually in the catalog, which seems like such a simple question, but I now have the answer to that. I will give it to you now in a secret. But um, <laughs> we are very closer to doing that. Uh, we also started thinking, giving serious thought to how the Perseus catalog might play better in a linked data ecosystem. Basically, um, using whether it was to use OCLC identifiers or to use these unique site URNs, but basically uh, we're really trying to think about the metadata we create and how it can live outside of this interface. Um, we're now explicitly encoding our version and expression level meta metadata. We have pushed the mod standards to the brink, I will admit, using the related item tags to encode works and expressions. But uh, for the moment, we're just converting data. Um, we, I won't talk too much more here because I would imagine I'm almost out of time. But basically, we thought a lot about how we had been using mods and how to use it better and more streamlined so that there would be a lot less data while still answering the same important question. We wanted to make sure that we still could link people to works, link people to translations, but we also wanted to be able to share that data and the way it was stored in GitHub and the way it had been broken up, it wasn't shareable with anyone. So I think I will end with our unresolved challenges. Um, one thing that we aren't doing right now is one of the strengths of the Perseus catalog metadata was that it had all of these links to inline pages. Like if you wanted to find a small author of an epigram, you could go right into the catalog and go right to that page in the Hopi Trust. And you know, it was that granular data that you're not gonna find in a traditional catalog record because really you don't have time to create that in a mark record. And so we, um, we, were, we kind of broke our system that created unique identifiers, so we're, we're sort of thinking on that as well. Uh, the current work right now is to review the um, catalog data. I'm Actually, I always swore I would never do this, but I'm manually creating identifiers for some versions just so we can get them into our new, our new system. And I'll end on, and we realized that one of the, the most comprehensive data source we had was actually our open access bibliography. So one thing that Cliff did was, because this had all types of authors and works that weren't in the catalog, so he created a MADS RDF database from the spreadsheet and created a bunch of um, MADS RDF records for authors and works because we had not created authority records for works and until people started asking us or pointing out errors, we realized there was no place to put that because we had authority records for authors but we couldn't put contested authorship and classical texts are all about contested authorship and we needed a metadata space where people could put that and also we would really love at some point in time to draw in data from other digital classic sources and we just had no place to put it. So I had stopped creating them because it took forever to create them by hand but we're obviously going to streamline something other than just me creating data. So I like to say we're kind of edging towards linked open data. Um, after about a year's work, we decided that work on an interface was just not as important as making the data shareable. There are, um, we're basically working to make sure the metadata in our catalog and our associate spreadsheets is better linked. Uh, we're working on an RDF knowledge base of statements about authors, works, expressions, and manifestations. We'd like to create a knowledge base that can be shared and linked to other tools and bibliographies. We're hoping to support machine readable applications. And we're also hoping by finally encoding this knowledge in RDF, there's so much work out there by OCLC, by other projects. We'd like to you know, better participate in that. And I think um, to conclude, um, our, the RDF we have generated does provide something unique. And there, in sort of the digital classics, digital humanities world, there is a, a huge amount of linked open data about authors and works that's been generated in the last few years and we're building and maintaining some new partnerships. And the one thing, our data that is unique is we do provide expression and manifest, the, ugh, forgive me, expression and manifestation level data that actually links to online versions, which a lot of people do like being able to use. And it's possible that the need for an interface will become redundant. I mean, at this point, we're focusing on the data, and if someone else can do a better API or a better interface, they can take our data, and then I don't have to do interface testing. Uh, and this is just um, the whole write up of this whole challenging process will appear soon in a gold open access book chapter, but I don't have a URL yet to class, and uh, that's just me reading about this whole process. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. So we thought we would take questions at the end, if that's all right. Um, we have our second presenter. Itza Carbajal is the Latin American metadata librarian at Lila Benson at the University of Texas at Austin. 
She works on metadata for post-custodial archival projects and digital archival collections. She'll be talking to us today about the Latin American Digital Initiatives Repository. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Let me pull up my slides because habits are hard to break. I don't want to learn how to open up a PDF on the other guy. So As Michelle mentioned, uh, my name is Ita Garbahaz. I am the Latin American Metadata Librarian at Lila Stenson at the University of Texas at Austin. I began my position uh, roughly a year and a half ago specifically for this project. Um, just notice I have very little slides and I'm going to throw a lot of keywords at you. The slides are available on the Google folder, um, but I won't go too much into detail about like what post-custodialism is or like what the project is, what our partners is, are, um, but it is a fascinating project um, and I hope you all will look deeper into it. So a very quick intro. Uh, I'm gonna say Latin American Digital Initiatives Project and that includes a digital repository, that includes the work around post-custodialism, that includes like the creation of partnerships, um, also the scouting of new collections, um, but typically when we talk about the online repository, we will also just say Latin American Digital Initiatives or LOTI, as I'll mention. It you began with a planning grant from the Mellon, um, particularly focused on developing post-custodial projects at Lila Stenson um, in a more formal way. We have uh, multiple projects that already use these principles and methods and other uh, situations in Latin America as well as in other countries in the world. Um, but with the planning grant, it was sort of formalizing that and then putting those collections online in a newer system versus kind of doing these boutique projects, which has had been our uh, previous practice. In the current phase, we're moving on from the planning grant, which was about, I think, 16 months, 18 months, to a two-year development grant that began last year in January. Um, the development grant not only included more funding for more partners and their collections, uh, but it also included the hiring of formal staff. In the initial planning grant, there was one staff hired um, that kind of took on the role of metadata librarian and digital processing archivist, not developer. We had assistance from our UT Libraries um, IT staff, um, but with the development grant, we were actually able to hire formal staff dedicated exclusively to this project. Uh, the planning grant started with partners in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, focusing on collections around um, 20th century, late 20th century conflict periods in those countries. Um, so our collections do begin with a uh, very sort of a sensitive uh, considerations around them. Uh, and then the development grant kind of expands out a little bit more, still with this focus on a kind of human rights context, which is one of our strengths at Lee Lesbenson, um, but not necessarily just focusing on human rights as a violation, but more so the testament of human rights uh, with partners in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. The scope overall is collaboration um, in the broadest sense, uh, using archival post-custodial methods to preserve and provide access to unique archival documentation from Latin America, with an emphasis on collections documenting human rights, race, ethnicity, and social exclusion in the region. And so I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly about kind of our technical hurdles. Uh, so as part of the development grant, um, we had proposed moving forward um, with updating our technology stack. And so we are a Drupal, Fedora, and Islandora sort of shop. Um, and with the development grant, our teams, including the libraries, and then my particular branch library, we were thinking of us as sort of an experiment to say when we do have to make the switch to the newest and greatest, what does that look like? Um, our collections at the end of the development grant should be around 8,000 objects, so we're not big at all. Um, and we're really new, we're not based in Mark, the majority of our materials are special collections, um, so we have a lot of leeway. And also we are really interested in kind of pushing back against established standards that are just about just sort of systematizing things in order for consistency, just because we've noticed that a lot of our partners typically end up losing a lot of sort of their agency 
and we try to box them into particular standards. Um, so our partners are the ones that create the metadata from themselves. Um, it was a bit difficult in the planning grant because there was no metadata librarian, so there was no sort of guidance or consultation. With the hiring of me, that's been a little bit more formalized, um, and so when our partners create their sort of schema, it's not necessarily just based out of thin air, but it is already kind of like a pre-mapping of what sort of field would be able to then come back into our system and be readable um, and systematic. Uh, so we're calling it Lottie 2.0, uh, but don't don't follow that sort of versioning because it's not true. Um, <laughs> and it includes exploration of Drupal 8, Fedora 5, and Claw, which is going to be now known as Island Door 8 um, as part of the grant proposal. Uh, the University of Texas at Austin Library System is very committed to becoming um, less of a boutique sort of institution and more towards the Drupal Island Door shop for digital collections in particular. And then Lottie in the first version was already sort of based on these te this technology stack, um, but we know that the upgrade was imminent and that if we have funding for it, we should do it just now um, and take a leap of faith which actually became a little bit more difficult um, and took a lot of faith for us to continue on this. Um, it's been very difficult to sort of align the development of CLAW as an instance with our timeline as a grant. So we have two years. We started in January of last year um, and there had already been rumors that CLAW was gonna be stable by I think August of last year. We're in May um, and it's going to supposedly launch in May. Uh, so it's been very much a moving target for us, um, but we are committed and I think we have sort of that cushioning that we're kind of treated as an experiment. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of times um, we're, are, we have a developer on staff, as I mentioned, a senior developer, um, and so they've been able to kind of contribute back to CLAW, even though we are still very much a custom shop around our needs as a project. Um, and we're planning on doing our soft launch in May as well then once CLAW or Island or Eight officially launches in whichever day it may, they end up launching, um, we're gonna do kind of a public hard launch in November with any sort of new pushes that they've done um, and then open to the public as well. So what this slide in particular kind of talks about like why link data, um, but I think really the bigger question for us was like, well, why not? You know, <laughs> they saved the thing, let's do this thing. Um, that again has also been um, a leap of faith that has brought on a lot of sort of like frustrations or anxiety for some of us. Um, but we're really interested in kind of just exploring what's out there and what kind of capabilities are out there based on these new technologies. Um, just as I mentioned, a lot of our principles aren't necessarily just established already. And so that's given us a lot of freedom to kind of play around um, and take risks. Um, we are very interested in sort of creating these uh, connections in particular for aggregators um, because we're an international collection, in particular a collection focused on Latin America and Spanish and Portuguese materials. Um, we understand that a lot of our other institutions around the world have collections that relate to ours as well and so we're really interested in just kind of creating those connections definitely outside of Austin. Um, and creating just that richer context for our materials. Uh, we're also interested in sort of dealing with our collections through this aspect of relationships, just because our materials are, you would call them like human rights materials, but that means many, 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 many things. Um, and so we have collections in the past that have dealt with human rights around like state violence. And so we're really interested in kind of seeing like how does that relate across the board? Like what does state violence look like? in all the countries that we work with, in all the time periods that we work with. Um, we're now becoming much stronger in land rights, in particular, say, with our partners in Brazil and Colombia. It's a testament of land rights um, through Afro-Latin Americans. And so what does that look like? What is the relationship between human rights defenders in both countries? What do their materials tell us when they're looked at together versus when you're just looking at them as one collection or just one object? We also are very interested in discoverability as a new project. I'm not sure how many of y'all actually knew we existed. Um, so really hoping um, that through using new technologies, we're just 
able to better put ourselves out there and in particular better put our, pro our partners out there because um, a lot of them are still very much out active in the work that they do. Uh, multilingual is a sort of given. Um, a lot of our, initially because our descriptions are created by our partners, they're created in the language of our partners and so we already have that strength. Um, but when we think about the resources, so much attention has been placed on sort of American resources or English resources that we're really trying to take advantage of materials that offer multilingual capacity. So say if you're looking at Wikidata, that already kind of has like a native multilingual component to it. Um, and like I mentioned, we are a pilot for other projects and initiatives. Um, so my university has launched um, their own digital asset management system that eventually will also have to make the leap um, to the new island Dora. Um, but we also have a lot of commitment in GIS work. And so there's just a lot of conversations that eventually I think we will all converge at one point. Um, and so our project is just kind of like a small little stepping stone in trying to accomplish these much bigger things. Also, eventually our catalog system will also change. <laughs> I am not doing that, so I won't open up that door right now, um, but it's, 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 in, it's on the way. <laughs> uh, and so I mentioned we have two launches set up for the rest of the year. Um, the project officially ends in December, but we might get an extension, um, and so there's just a lot of things in the works as of right now as I talk to you. Um, and so the planning, during the planning grant, uh, because there was no metadata librarian, we went with mods just because that was used by our other metadata librarians. Um, but now we're moving to RDF and kind of creating those content models for our collections, uh, starting to prep those files. So some of those files are already with us um, in our hands, in our servers, um, and some of those are getting created as we speak. <laughs> um, and so it's always kind of like also another moving target um, to adjust our metadata practices when we know that all of our partners kind of come with different needs and different situations. Uh, we are taking sort of like a mixed anthology approach just because we have special collection materials. Some anthologies are better suited for us versus others. Um, we've got our setup, kind of our structural setup is already set. I hope we wouldn't go into soft launch if it wasn't, um, but I think we're just trying to tweak the last uh, sort of just our MVP um, then we also have areas of concern, because I think at one point in our planning, we were really interested in exploring, and then we have to realize that because of the situation of our material and the context around them, we also can't just be about exposing everything. And so what does privacy look like? What does actually like link open data? How is that actually going to impact us negatively, and in particular impact our partners negatively? Um, and so there might be a lot of uh, things that we learn and then just kind of take a step back and say, oh, we're not gonna do that. Um, and then also map new directions. So if we get our extension, uh, our funding extension, what does that look like? What does development look like? Um, who needs to come into the conversation? Who do we need to connect to outside of UT? That's also a big interest of ours. Um, once Island Art 8 comes out, push those updates, because those seem to always be coming up. Um, and then we have, we do have our triple store graph database up and running, um, but then trying to see how querying can better help our users when they're trying to analyze all the materials we have. Um, and then also just kind of staying in line or as close to the best practices of other community members, whether that's the Island Dora community or the San Bear community. So I thought I was gonna be able to give you all a demo, but I guess I talked much more than I thought I would. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the old site. Um, come back in November and I'll be the new site. <laughs> if you have questions, just let me know. Thank you. So we have just a couple minutes for questions. Karen, yeah, for Allison. So your focus was on manifestations, expressions, or whatever. Um, but Curtis was one of the first scholarly contributions to VX back yes. in 2013. Yes, I know my young colleague managed that while I was on maternity leave. Yeah, so, <laughs> but interest, so in a way, you already have linked data available for your names. Yes, well, no, for, for the names, the names were never a problem. But we haven't received any updates since 2013. If you want one, we can give you one. I just don't know how to do that. Okay, because when you were talking about all the restructuring you had to do, 
because mm -hmm. I was wondering whether that affected Well, you know, the, the, the two people who manage that are no longer associates, um, so you, honestly, if you know the person to put me in touch with, then it's how I do that. <laughs> okay, because that's part of the maintenance. I mean, yes. you know, it's um, once you publish, if others are consuming it, this yes. idea, then that the goes up. was a godsend for me because until that, I was using like these German DMV records because the Germans cataloged everything, Greg used to joke. And so I would have this tiny little law firm. I'm like, I don't want to create an authority record. I want to call me. It's Friday. And so I would find something in Mark Dick's mail and I'd transform it to them and then it would go from there. So, and now I, I think I've created one authority record in the last two years because, you know, typically somebody, someone somewhere has already cataloged something from this person. So it's a lot faster that way. Sharing is good. It's not just for my five year old sharing is good. <laughs> the question of agency and trying to enforce consistency sometimes um, created you know, an unhelpful dynamic. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so uh, at the top of my head, I think like the subject terms were always the most difficult ones, um, just because we initially we were dealing with collections around human rights. Uh, there were very difficult connections between the subject terms that I would find in Library of Congress versus the ones that are partners with probably their subjects by, um, and I'm trying to think. So, because we're doing the translation also from Spanish, and now Spanish and Portuguese, we were thinking a lot around like what formats or types of resource um, or genre look like, um, and so it became sort of, um, if we didn't have it and we needed to use this authority record, then we slightly added our own interpretation to and so then it was us as the final institution, the receiving institution, that then imposed, well, you know, you say it's this, but I'm going to call it this. <laughs> yeah, Allison, uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, when you were running, you had issues using GitHub as a mechanism for storing and managing metadata. I was kind of curious what the detail on that was. What particularly were you It wasn't actually, the problem wasn't with GitHub, the problem was the learning curve for staff. I would say GitHub itself, GitHub has actually been wonderful in that it has been much easier for us to share data with people. For the longest time, the only way you could get access to, a, to um, the public domain purchase text is you had to find the text and then click on the XML download, or you had to download the entire D of the corpus, which a lot of people didn't want to do. You know, sometimes they just wanted one XML text of a particular play of Euripides or a particular work by Cicero, and now it's much easier to go directly to the TIXML and download it. And um, so I think the problem with that was less, it was more getting the data there because it involved a lot of reorganizing in terms of, because for the longest time it was a huge transition project because all the Perseus text had these legacy IDs, which is how they were managed in our document management system, and then they were reorganized according to the system called canonical text systems, where things are grouped under a text group, which is a fancy way of saying author. And IDs. I mean, it, it's more complicated than that, but everything had to get reorganized and broken down, and so it was just, it was a lot of work getting there. But now that all of our stuff's in there, it's, it's wonderful. It was more the process. I think it's just the process of moving from closed to open, because, you know, it's a public repository, and so, you know, there's nothing like having a, a, someone that you don't know comment on, like, one of your commits or something. Like, oh, glad that's finally in there, so. Yeah, which is also wonderful, because you get to interact with your community in new ways, but it's, it's an ever, sort of an ever greater level of openness and that I used to joke that, you know, because I always have pictures of my pets as my avatars, even though I use my name. It just it, it's a new level I think of public identity associated with your work that can take a little bit of getting used to and then you move into it, but it, it can take some time. Hope I answered your question. You did. It wasn't a lot about versioning, I suppose. <laughs> uh, speaking of TDI, I was wondering if you were also um, cataloging digital editions. All of ours, Beyond Perseus is on. Yes, yes. Um, all of Perseus and um, we're, that's actually been a challenge in terms of the collection grew with far more than one little metadata librarian could keep up with. And there's also been the, the question of what we're linking to. Because there are a lot of texts right now, like the records for Perseus in my catalog link to the online HTML page. Because that's what people are thinking of using. And we've created a lot of texts that right now are only in GitHub or they're viewable through our new viewer, the state viewer, but that's a lot of text, and we're trying
trying to figure out what do we want to link to because we'd love to get people to both the GitHub source, but most people when they think of finding something in Perseus, they're thinking of a reading environment. They're thinking of a text that they can use. And so that's been a question of what to link to and then how to store those links because I originally created a, bu I created a bunch of links to text in GitHub and then we changed our directory structure and all those links, of course, were no longer valid. And you can, you can map those things. They 